There are certain things that I was taught and I just assumed were evil. Ticket scalping, price gouging, child labor, insider trading. They're bad. They hurt people, drag the economy down. But then I stumbled across this book. It was like a jungle gym for my brain. Suddenly I learned that ticket scalpers don't necessarily cheat people. They provide a valuable service. I learned that some businesses that use what we call child labor actually help children. I learned that so-called price gouging saves lives. So I'm thankful to the author of that book, economist Walter Block, for turning my brain around. I'd have him here to defend some of these ideas, except he's in Argentina and couldn't be here tonight. So here to explain these counterintuitive, but generally really smart libertarian ideas are Nick Gillespie from Reason Magazine and David Bowes of the Cato Institute. So one at a time, guys. I mean, child labor. People you're, say you're going to defend child labor. That's evil. Look, nobody is going to be using child labor in the United States in a rich country today. It just doesn't happen. Except running lemonade stands, which are being shut down all over the country. There's like a reign of terror against lemonade stands. But in terms of factories, we don't do that anymore because we're rich now. We want our kids to go and to school. And because child labor is wrong. When we talk about child labor today, we're really talking about very poor countries. We're talking about the third world. And if we say there that the United States should abolish child labor in very poor countries, then what will happen, what will happen to these children? They're not going to suddenly go to Harvard. They're not going to suddenly go to the country day school. Their parents will starve if they don't all work, if the whole family doesn't work. So they may be out selling their bodies on the street. That doesn't seem like an improvement over working in a t-shirt factory. And in fact, where child labor was suddenly banned in these countries, prostitution went up. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, you know, it's not a question of uh, the kids are dying to work, and if they can't work in a factory, they'll become prostitutes. It's that the countries and the people and the families and the kids need the money. They don't have excess money. Everybody is working. Next, price gouging. Several states have laws against it. Attorney General Mississippi said this is just people taking advantage of people in need. Price gouging, say, on high prices for something after Hurricane Katrina. Water mm -hmm. prices went up. The price of a generator went up. If, if I'm in the neighborhood of Hurricane Katrina, what I want is water and ice and generators being plentiful, being in supply there. And if you're in Kentucky and you've got a generator, you've got 10 generators in your store, are you going to get up? This actually really happened. Yeah. Some, are you going to get up at 4 a.m. and drive all night, drive all day to get to Louisiana to sell these generators if you can only sell them for the same price you could sell them for in Kentucky? No, you're going to go down there because demand is higher, need is higher, and you can sell them for more. And the same even thing Even if it's is, triple the price. Even if it's triple the price because then you'll get triple the generators. You'll get people to work hard to bring these things there. And it is precisely the higher prices that will, number one, cause people to want to make that long drive and get those things where they're needed right now. And number two, will cause people to sell them to people who have the most need as opposed to just giving them to your daughter because, after all, if it's all the same price, why not give it to your daughter it, or to a politically connected mayor? It's also true. I mean, in the recent heat wave, uh, you know, air conditioners sold out everywhere. If, if if uh, sellers could raise the price of those, then the people who really wanted them would be able to get them. And it's important to recognize that outlets, retailers, are not in the business of screwing over people today for a couple extra bucks in order to destroy their customer base down the future. So there's a lot of mitigating factors involved here. Ticket scalping. People describe them as these sleazy guys who cheat you. And also, they're not the musicians. They're not the football team. Why should they get the money? Well, you know, I like to think of ticket scalpers as the guys who stand in line so that I don't have to anymore. If you're old enough to remember a pre-ticket master or a pre-ticketron America, you oftentimes waited to listen to a radio show where they would say, okay, tickets are finally going on sale for this concert. And then you would run out there and try and get there before they were all sold. What ticket scalpers do simply is allow more people to see a show without having to run out in the middle of the night or the middle of the day or whenever tickets originally go on sale. Selling a body part, selling an organ, seems wrong to people. It also seems wrong to have people dying because they can't get a kidney. And so sometimes you have to weigh these things. Is it better off to have people 
prohibited from doing something that does seem kind of grotesque, or is it better to have people not dying because they need a kidney? And Let me and just break that down. We have two kidneys. We only need one. Some 40,000 Americans are on a waiting list now hoping for a new kidney, and they're not allowed to pay for one. Right. That's right. And, you know, we, we do sell hair, we sell sperm, we sell eggs these days. So we're already selling lots of our bodily production. But I hear these stories, that's, these that's, poor people who just to make $1,000 in some third world country, they have a scar they show, they waste it, and they're well, out of kidney. Uh, but, uh, no, but, uh, you know, they're not out of kidney. They're up a thousand bucks or whatever it is. Uh, well, they are out of kidney. Well, yeah, but they only need one, right? Uh, at they, least that's what we're hoping. Most anyway. of them. Um, but, you know, the only person now in terms of, like, organ transplant systems, the only person in that exchange who doesn't get compensated is the donor. The doctor makes money, the patient gets a benefit, the hospital covers all of its costs. There is a chronic shortage of things like kidneys out there. The best way to grow the supply of that, and as David was talking about, to allow more people to live is to allow a market to price those organs. All right, insider trading. We lock people up who get that information first, and... The argument is that makes stock trading more fair. Well, what really makes stock trading more fair is having all the information that is known about the value of the company and the value of the stock reflected in the price of the stock, because we all want to buy stocks at a fair value. All the information goes into making up that fair value. But you get the information first. How is that fair? Somebody always gets information first. I, I mean, there's really no way around that. What's best for me is to have fairly priced stocks everywhere. Now, companies may have a reason not to want employees to release this information. And it might be good reasons to protect trade secrets. And it might be bad reasons to protect corruption and skullduggery and the fact that Enron had no actual business. Uh, but was just riding on stories, companies can create contractual relations with their employees that prohibit them from trading on certain kinds of information, and then investors can decide whether companies are more valuable when they have these kinds of restrictions on trading. That's the sort of decision investors make all the time in the marketplace. The real fear of insider trading is that if people believe it to be rampant, they won't invest because they'll feel like they're only being used as right. suckers. Over the long haul, all of the empirical studies of insider trading or the effects of that show that it essentially has little to no effect on investor confidence. Uh, and what you need to balance any fears of insider trading ab about are the regulations that would be put in place to prevent it. It just gets into a morass very quickly. Well, right now we spend a lot of money chasing these people down and locking up a few, like Martha Stewart. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she was not found guilty or she was not charged with insider trading, by the way. She was charged with obstructing justice for essentially for proclaiming her innocence to the press. One man who was arrested uh, was arrested for printing his own currency, and he, uh, his coins featured, here's the guy, he made these coins, uh, some of them featured Ron Paul's face, they were called Liberty <laughs> Dollars, and he was told, we were told, I'm told they are illegal because they would compete with United States currency and That's therefore right. he must be arrested. All, so. all governments among the very first things that they do is they control the currency supply and they try to get rid of competing money uh, in places like the Soviet Union and Cuba. So you should I be, be allowed to peddle these? Uh, you know what, I, you can try. I Good don't luck. know how, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's not Ron Paul on, the, on the, uh, the dollar bill there. But governments always try to control and restrict currency because it gives them a huge amount of power in places like the Soviet Union and Cuba, you can be put to death for counterfeiting money. This guy wasn't counterfeiting money. He was making silver coins and selling them for what people thought was a fair price. He shouldn't be in jail for that, but you can understand why governments want to control currency supplies. Um, if, if I make a bracelet out of silver, that's perfectly legal. And if I trade you the bracelet for you giving a speech, that's perfectly legal. It's only if I turn the silver into something that looks like a coin and I give you that, then they say I'm competing with the government's currency. Well, that's true. The government has produced a currency that has lost 95% of its value since the Federal Reserve took it over. I would think maybe a one-ounce silver coin from a reliable businessman would be worth more. 
And we are allowed to trade gold coins, and I don't think I would be arrested selling something like this. You might very well be. If they can claim that you're trying to present it as currency, you've made it kind of look like a dollar bill, and it may therefore be illegal. Yeah, that's right. It was nice knowing you. Say hello to Martha Stewart. And, and we're allowed, you know, you're allowed to go and buy a gold coin. But I don't think you're allowed to use gold as legal tender. Right. If, if, if you want to hand Sears a gold coin for a refrigerator, I don't think they're supposed to take that. And the government, as Nick says, doesn't want competition. They want to monopolize this incredibly essential service. And finally, you both say we should legalize sin, basically. Drug, drug use, prostitution, gambling. So uh, an interesting crowd you have. A lot of people, yeah. unusual libertarian crowd, but most non-libertarians would say that's indefensible. No, it isn't. Uh, first off, you know, when it comes to owning your own body and what you do with consenting adults, nobody should be able to stand in the way of that as a basic principle. But then beyond that, even if you don't believe that, you have to look at what are, what's the cost of prohibiting this? What's the cost of regulating it? And in each of those cases, the harms done by the regulations are far worse than the activities themselves. What should be illegal is inflicting harm on other people, violating their rights. And so putting drugs in your own body, gambling with your own money, these things are not the government's business. In a free society, adults should be able to do that.